can sit some other down, man. They are so fucking bad. You guys need to start fucking watching them because they are the best fucking bands in the fucking world right now. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we're here to talk about System of a Down. They've sold over 10 million albums. They've won a Grammy. They were the first metal band to hit 1 billion on YouTube and Spotify with Chop Suey. And with so much mainstream success, they've introduced millions of fans to the genre, but without ever compromising on their vision. Their music is just wildly eclectic, combining everything from the Beatles to black metal to Armenian folk music. Some of the most innovative interesting stuff to ever hit the mainstream. And maybe even more importantly, they've also always had a powerful message, in particular raising a lot of awareness for the Armenian genocide and other social issues to the point where they were banned on the radio after the 9-11 attacks. And somehow, despite not having released an album in almost 20 years, they remain one of the most popular and influential metal bands of their generation. And so the question is, how do they do it? And what is their lasting legacy and impact? Those are the questions that I will try to answer in this video. And also, I'd like to thank Factor for sponsoring this video. If you're busy with holiday plans, but you still want to eat well, and you should, then check out Factor. They make nutritious, chef-prepared meals that are delivered straight to your door, and they're ready to eat in just two minutes. That means you can skip the trip to the grocery store and all the chopping and the prep and the cleanup and all that, while still getting the flavor and nutrition that you need. And if you eat out a lot, it's a great way to save money. It's cheaper than takeout or even worse, delivery, which if you ask me, is a complete ripoff. And also they have a ton of options. Personally, I like Calorie Smart, which is under 550 calories per serving. But they also have new lunch to go meals that are ready to eat with no microwave required and their fancy new surf and turf options. Personally, I love that I don't have to think about what to eat for lunch. I just pick something and I know that it's gonna taste good and that I'm also gonna hit my macro goals. So if you wanna check out Factor, and honestly, I think you should, head to factor75.com or click the link below and use the code PUNK50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. System of a Down formed in 1994, originally called Victims of a Down, based on a poem by guitarist Darren Malakian, until bassist Shavo Odajian suggested they change their name to System of a Down. For one, because he thought that name would appeal to a wider audience, but also because that meant that alphabetically, they would be filed closer to one of their favorite bands, Slayer. And they quickly got to work playing their first show in early 1995 and recording their first demo shortly after that, which is notable for being much heavier than their later material. They followed that up with their second 1995 demo, which is really where they started to come into their own. It's pretty impressive that they found their groove so early. Of the four songs on the demo, three of them ended up being on their first album, although they do sound pretty different on this demo. And they kept their foot on the gas pedal, releasing a total of five demo tapes and quickly building a local following. As Darren said, the two or three years that we were selling out clubs and had a huge buzz in LA, nobody wanted to sign us because we were Armenian. We were told there's a big Armenian community in LA, but who's going to get you in Germany? Who's going to get you in these places where they don't know what an Armenian is? And one of the people who noticed the success they were getting was the legendary producer Rick Rubin, known for working with artists like Beastie Boys, Run DMC, Slayer, and Red Hot Chili Peppers, among many others. But as much as he loved the band, even he had his doubts. They were my favorite band, but I didn't think anybody was going to like them apart from a small, like-minded group of people like me who were crazy. No one was waiting for an Armenian heavy metal band. And what's interesting to me is that even then they were branded as this like Armenian band when they've never really seen themselves that way at all. As their vocalist Serge said in an early interview, we're proud of our heritage and it's definitely an influence that we don't want to deny as far as our music and standing and some of our thinking. It's just not specifically something that we're trying to involve in our music and say, hey, look, we're Armenian. But despite his concerns, Rick Rubin signed them to his label American and they went into the studio after at the last minute replacing their original drummer with John Dolbyan. And they released their first full-length album, System of Down, in 1998 with Sugar as the lead single. 
And this song is, to put it bluntly, weird. Like the first line of the song is the kombucha mushroom people sitting around all day long. What is that? The song also just like completely changes feel every few seconds. The video is super political. Nothing about this is accessible at all. And yet somehow it became kind of a breakthrough hit for them getting regular airplay on rock radio and even on MTV. The second single Spiders was more subdued and showed that they weren't just this like crazy zany metal band. And that song was also picked up by rock radio as well as appearing on the soundtrack for Scream 3. And somehow, to the surprise of pretty much everybody involved, by 2000, the album had gone gold. As John Dolmayan said, We never expected Sugar or Spiders to be embraced by MTV or to be on the radio. We never expected anything to be on the radio. We thought we would be a very underground band, but for some reason, the mainstream has kind of accepted it. Even the notoriously uptight Pitchfork gave it an 8 out of 10 and kind of predicted the future. As they said, quote, Imagine the scene. It's 2002. System of a Down and Slayer are again playing on the same bill, but this time the audience is chanting for the former. Sure, it's unlikely, but for how many bands would it even be conceivable? Which brings us to their second album, Toxicity. And the question here was, could they follow up this groundbreaking album? Or would they fall into the so-called sophomore slump, which is what happens when so many bands have this great debut, but then kind of run out of ideas and deliver a mediocre second album? And from the beginning, they were determined not to do that, even if that meant turning down some truly amazing opportunities. As John Dolmayan said, It was a difficult decision, but we knew the follow-up had to be something really strong. And to do that, we had to turn down Iron Maiden, Metallica, bands we've idolized and been listening to all of our adult lives. But as tough as that decision must have been in the moment, it turned out to be the right call. After spending months in the studio, again with Rick Rubin as producer, they emerged with a complete album. And their choice for the lead single was a song called Suicide, which after being pressured by the label, they eventually retitled to Chop Suey. And when the song came out in August of 2001, to say that it changed everything for the band would be a massive understatement. Wake up, wake up, run, rush and put a little makeup. Despite sounding like absolutely nothing else on the radio, to me it's almost like a more accessible version of Dillinger Escape Plan or as Kerrang called it, a heavier version of Bohemian Rhapsody because it changes feel so abruptly and frequently. The song somehow became a radio hit and got into regular rotation on MTV. And when the album came out, it debuted at number one on Billboard over people like Alicia Keys, NSYNC, and Mary J. Blige. But unfortunately, the timing for their success couldn't have been worse. It was the week of September 11th, 2001. As bassist Shavo Odajian remembers, I answered the phone and it was my mom saying, put on the TV. I turn on the TV and all of a sudden the second tower falls. At the same time, my phone beeps again and I pick up. It's my manager and he says, congratulations, you're number one on Billboard. The timing wasn't great and the content of the album didn't help either. With song titles like Jet Pilot and their most popular breakthrough song with a hook that contains the phrase self-righteous suicide. A lyric which actually got them banned from clear channel radio stations, along with other metal artists like Megadeth, Metallica, and Ozzy, and pretty much anybody else that had any sort of song titles or lyrics that they thought might be poorly received in the wake of 9-11. A few days after 9-11, Surge also posted an essay on their website calling out what he believed to be American mistakes in Middle Eastern foreign policy, which was deeply unpopular and got a lot of blowback. I guess Surge put a statement on his website and now he's taking uh, tons of crap for it we gave him crap for it yesterday uh he uh, bravely said he'd come on the air and, and try to explain because he feels he's getting a bum rap and on top of all of that the band was also getting harassed and racially profiled as Shavo said, In the Midwest and in the South, there were some remarks made. They thought Armenians were Middle Eastern because nobody knew what an Armenian was. We were pigeonholed as camel jockeys, terrorists, all these crazy slurs. And for anyone who doesn't know, Armenians are not Arabs and the official state religion of Armenia is Christianity. So they would have absolutely nothing to do with the 9-11 attackers. But obviously back then, a lot of people didn't see it that way. But still, none of that could stop their momentum. Chop Suey may have been 
banned from the radio, but it still got heavy MTV airplay. And the follow-up singles, Toxicity and Aerials, were both Billboard Top 100 songs. And with songs criticizing everything from the militarization of the police to humanity's mistreatment of the planet, although System of a Down kind of got lumped in with the new metal thing, with Surge's kind of weird vocals and highly political lyrics, to me, they were almost more like an updated version of the Dead Kennedys. But in spite of all that success, or actually maybe because of it, cracks were already starting to form in the band. As Darren Malakian said, Chop Suey was a really great thing for System of a Down. It made us more famous, made us more money, and it elevated us as a headlining arena band. But at the same time, that's around the time where we all started getting separate buses and living our own separate lives as well. And being as busy as they were riding the wave of Toxicity's success, the band was in no place to record new material. But fortunately, they had 16 songs left over from the Toxicity sessions that didn't make it onto the album because, as Surge put it, quote, they didn't fit into the overall continuity of the album. And even with all this mainstream success, they didn't back off on their politics. With the lead single, Boom, being accompanied by a Michael Moore-directed video, which protested the war in Iraq. Boom. Every time you drop the bomb, you kill the god your child has born. With that being said, the album was essentially a collection of B-sides and outtakes that was just sort of intended to hold people over until the next album. And most fans these days rank Steal This Album as their least favorite. And they followed that up with what would prove to be their last albums, the double release of Mesmerize and Hypnotize in 2004 and 2005, respectively. These were originally written as one album, but just like with Toxicity and Steal This Album, they ended up coming out as two separate releases and basically just picked up where the first album left off. The debut single was BYOB, or Bring Your Own Bombs, which criticized the American military for, in their view, recruiting the poor to fight its wars. Everybody's going to the party, have a real good and what I find interesting is that even as they were doing their most accessible, mainstream friendly kind of music, like the chorus of BYOB, at the same time, there were also more extreme metal elements than ever. For example, here. That song hit the Billboard Top 40 and won a Grammy, which I'm pretty sure is the only time a song with a blast beat in it has done either of those things. Or the black metal part in this song, which may seem surprising, but I think it's also worth noting that Darren signed Satyricon to his label around the same time. <laughs> They followed that up with Hypnotize, which also went to number one on Billboard, making it their third number one album. It seemed like the band was doing better than ever and just couldn't be stopped. Everything they touched just turned to gold. But what nobody knew at the time is that this would almost certainly be the last album that they would ever release. In 2006, the band suddenly announced that they would be going on hiatus, which usually means like we're breaking up, we just don't want to say it. Although the band clarified that in this case, that wasn't true. As Darren said at the time, we're not breaking up. We're going to take a very long break after Ozfest and do our own things, which they did. Darren and John did a project called Scars on Broadway. Surge put out several solo albums and Shavo collaborated with the RZA among many other projects that they were involved with. And they eventually did come back in 2011 for a round of international touring and festival dates and played their first ever show in Armenia in 2015. But what never came back was more music or more regular touring. And the question on everybody's mind was why? Why couldn't this great band who was at one time incredibly prolific putting out five demos in two years, why couldn't they manage to put out another album or even consistently tour? Some fans speculated that it was because of the growing political differences within the band, specifically between Serge and John. For example, back in 2020, when John spoke out in favor of Donald Trump, calling him, quote, the most attacked president in history, yet the greatest friend to minorities. But as much as people may have thought that would be a problem for the band, that doesn't actually seem to be the case. No, that's got nothing to do with it. Okay. Sit down and have a discussion about politics and and be okay with walking away and having a difference of opinion, you know, if we ha if we happen to have one. Other people speculated that the real issue was simply that Surge wasn't into making more music or touring again, which actually does seem to be the case based on a Facebook post he made where he laid it all out. 
As he said, it is true that I and only I was responsible for the hiatus that System of a Down took in 2006. Everyone else wanted to continue at the same pace to tour and make records. I didn't. And his reasons for that involved several factors. Number one is that he felt that the band's music was getting redundant and he just didn't want to make what he felt was the same album over and over and over. Number two was money, specifically that because Darren was the primary songwriter, that meant he was getting more money than anyone else in the band. And number three, injuries to his back that made it physically difficult for him to do consistent touring. And with Serge as the front man of the band, he wasn't really replaceable. So without him, things just really couldn't move forward. But with all of that being said, they were able to put their differences aside in 2020 to benefit the Armenia Fund, which helped people displaced by the conflict between Artsakh and Azerbaijan. I just wanted to write a song that was Armenian related, Armenian history related, but showed us as um, victors and not victims. And what was really interesting to me is that from a musical perspective, it felt like they really hadn't lost a step at all. In fact, this might actually be their most extreme material ever, even 25 years into their career, with some parts that are basically straight up black metal. And as for the future, at this point, it seems pretty unlikely that System of a Down will ever make another album, but who knows? And even with a relatively small amount of recorded output, their influence has been huge. First of all, they introduced a whole generation of kids to like weird progressive metal and got them into the pipeline that eventually leads to bands like Periphery, Meshuggah, and Gojira. And maybe most importantly of all, they made millions of people aware of the Armenian Genocide, where over 1 million Armenians were killed by what would later become the country of Turkey. And of course, their fans continue to hold out hope for more music, but even if it never comes, System of a Down will always hold a special place in metal history. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments, and I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. Patrons get all my videos and podcasts early. I do giveaways. There are members only channels in my discord that I'm super active in, and there's even a way to have me review your music. So if any of that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.